Is that, is that okay not to do a camera? Yep. Okay. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, or DSIAC one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. DSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the defense systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the defense systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Defense Systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Defense Systems research. Well, good morning, afternoon, evening to everybody who joined. Appreciate uh, you all joining in kind of a, a last minute notification of this webinar. A um, couple bits of logistics before we begin. I hand the mic over to Sam for the presentation. Um, first of all, if you were joined in the webinar platform online, you can submit a question. I want to direct your attention at least to the top middle of your screen should show a little uh, dialogue icon where you can submit a question. At any time during the presentation, I would encourage you to submit a question and get that in queue. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll save some time for a little uh, Q&A that I will moderate. Um, also wanted to let you know that if you have any technical issues during this presentation, one, rest assured it's being uh, recorded, so you can always catch up on it later. Um, and two, you can dial in. The, the dial-in information um, should be on our, our webpage for this webinar. If it's not there already. Um, and you can actually grab the slides directly from our webinar webpage. So if you went to dsix.org, went to our webinars and found this one, you can grab the slides and follow along while listening um, to the audio through your phone. Um, and then the last one specific for this webinar, this is a, a webinar that's specifically derived from a state of the art report that we recently published. So um, as Sam will certainly uh, mention here, if you do want to get more information on anything that's covered here, uh, you can I would direct you to the state of the art report. Again, you can find that directly from our website, dsiac.org, um, and find the latest state of the art report from there. Okay, um, so that's about it from the introductory portion. I will hand the mic over to Sam for the presentation. Sam, floor is yours. Thank you, Brian, appreciate it. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, presentation. Uh, this presentation is based on the, uh, the state of the art report that was published. So go ahead and uh, lay out uh, the uh, the content. So uh, the outline is going to be uh, divided in the following. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, essentially the AI foreign threats um, and, and why uh, the U.S. Uh, Armed Forces, defense research, and intelligence community need to uh, to ramp up the efforts to for research and development of AI technologies. Uh, we're going to talk about brief history of AI and ML, and we start talking about state of the art methods. Essentially, uh, talking about particular paradigms that are um, hot research areas, essentially. Uh, as opposed to some classical concepts from AI. Um, we talk about the learning AI in particular, the optimization uh, techniques, and also a few emergence AI paradigms. And then we'll talk about applications of AI for weapon systems and which areas in weapon systems these uh, technologies can be leveraged to provide 
cutting edge systems that will provide a uh, an advantage in the battlefield. So we talk about autonomous systems, perception, GNC, mission planning, intelligence strategy, opponent modeling, and cognitive warfare, and also specify some of the ongoing programs by the government, uh, particularly, obviously, the DOD and uh, DARPA's efforts in this regard. And we'll also mention some of the private, uh, private company systems uh, that are in collaboration with the DOD to, uh, to be in this path towards uh, creating systems that, that are uh, changing the, the landscape for the next generation of warfare. And then we'll summarize and take some questions afterwards. So the, the problem statements essentially is about uh, intelligence-based warfare and advanced robotics and hypersonic weapons, they are essentially uh, the new breed of qualitative challenges to U.S. armed forces in the new era. And recent advances in the field of machine learning and AI have shown that there are major potential advantages of integrating AI in warfare. Uh, cutting edge offensive and defensive, defensive capabilities of AI weapon systems uh, increase lethality, survivability, improve performance and maintainability, and support automatic decision making in a highly dynamic environment. And in the latest the report in 2020, the National Security Commissioner has urged the foundation of widespread integration of AI across DOD do domain uh, enterprise, enterprises by to be to be in place by 2025. So. Uh, there is definitely a, an official urgency in that in that regard, and this is just to highlight some of the um, in the, the contest of why America essentially and its allies need to to increase ever further its effort in this in this domain of AI research, and just to showcase. Uh, what China in particular is doing, as well as Russia, is that China has the largest share of AI research publications in the world since 2017. It has also been first with 70, almost 75% of the global share of AI-related IP in the past decade. It has ranked 2012 in Global Innovation Index in the last year. And is also actively engaging in the in the intelligentizations, if you will, that is rendering some of the system more intelligence in their arsenal to be more capable by integrating AI in combat operation and systems. Uh, Russia, on the other hand, is sixth in terms of government strategy. So they 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 are actively uh, eyeing. AI technologies in multiple fields uh, of, of, of engineering and services uh, to acquire AI technologies to be more efficient and better uh, uh, for, for, for their purposes. But essentially, it is uh, it has adopted a national strategy similar or akin to the U.S. Uh, strategy. Um, so it's, they call it National Strategy for Development of AI, and it's, it has, it goes through 2030, so that's already 2019. Um, and again, there is an effort for boosting the private investments in domestic AI industries as a key policy for statewide adoption of AI. And this plot just to showcase that, uh, in terms of journal publications, um, in the last ten years, you can see that China has increased effort and is and is and it has got about eighteen percent of AI journal publication shares. In the lower graph, we have the AI journal citation in the by in total total citation in the world, and China is also in the past five years is gaining momentum and it's about twenty point seven. Uh, for, for that citation um, share and uh, in comparison to the U.S. and Europe. Uh, 
Uh, and the last uh, graph, we have the peer-reviewed artificial uh, intelligence publications. And as well, you can see that 20, 20% uh, 20 but 22% uh, is by China and 16% for uh, European Union and 14% in the US. Um, just to showcase uh, these, these efforts by China in particular. In a brief history of AI, um, obviously AI is only possible with uh, the advent of machines and the backbone of any machine for decision making is obviously a logical entity that is able to, um, to compute logical statements. And the first current machine that um, has employed Boolean logic um, started in 1869 by William Jenin, who created the first machine that implemented logic, uh, logic computation based on uh, Boolean logic. Uh, John von Neumann, the computer scientist and mathematician, has in 1928 created discrete algorithm uh, called the Minimax algorithms or Minimax algorithms. Um, so he proved that uh, in, in 1928. Some of the earliest concepts uh, during the World War era uh, was created by uh, Maclock and Pitts who pioneered the maclock pitts theory of formal networks. That is the birth of the concept of neural networks. Um, shortly after the World War II, uh, we have uh, pioneers like John McCarthy during the first AI conferences has coined the, the word artificial intelligence to refer to machine intelligence. Um, in uh, 1957, Frank Rosen Rosenblatt, uh, who is the father actually of the development of a perceptron. The perceptron are the, the simplest models for neural, neural network operation. And he uh, essentially developed a mathematical model um, named perceptron this, this, when it describes how neurons in our brain uh, operate. Uh, mathematically speaking, uh, the um, some of the concepts like reinforcement learning are based on um, MDPs. These are Markov uh, decision processes, uh, which are mathematical concepts created by uh, Richard Billman, who introduced this concept to lay out the foundation for what, what is to come as reinforcement learning. But it's also, these are tied concept to optimal control theory, or the, the early concept of optimal control theory, particularly the dynamic programming. Uh, some of the early um, algorithms for these uh, Markov decision processes uh, is the policy iteration model uh, method. So Ronald Howard developed this policy iteration methods for MDP. And then in the area of robotics, uh, the algorithm was path, uh, for path planning or finding the shortest path in a cluttered environment, static nonetheless cluttered environment is the algorithm called A star. That's a path planning algorithm by Niels Nielsen. That was developed in 1968. Um, obviously, this 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 uh, timeline is not exhaustive, but it just sheds the light on uh, the sequential development of key technologies within the AI computer science. Uh, Again, in robotics, uh, the, in the 60s and the early 70s, uh, we can see the earliest uh, machines uh, that, are, uh, that, that provide some early, some early manifestations of, of the source of intelligence that, uh, you know, it's an infancy, but, but it, it, is, it is part of robotic research. But we have the Wabot 1 robot. Uh, which was developed in 1972 and is considered the first anthropomorphic intelligent robot. Uh, the 80s uh, are um, replete with uh, innovations in the domain of uh, neural networks. So the development of multi-layer perceptron opened the, the gate for the, uh, 
the forward neural networks field. So uh, in 1986, the multilayer perceptron was developed and shortly after the development of recurrent neural networks in 1986. Not too far after, uh, we have the Bayesian neural networks and the development of the convolutional neural networks, which are based on the uh, uh, based on the, uh, the the visuals uh, visual system uh, of, of uh, humans and animals uh, to model after that essentially. Um, so the, in 1992 is the development of uh, bots. These are machines that employ some sort of sophisticated algorithms for a purpose. But uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, reinforcement learning, uh, essentially, it's it, the the adaptations of these algorithms were were geared towards uh, games, essentially, to prove the concept. Uh, TD Gammon program was trained by self-play uh, reinforcement learning um, in the backgammon games. Um, and 1997, uh, we have Deep Blue uh, that beats uh, humans in uh, chess. He beat essentially Gary Kasparov. Um, I can remember that day, in fact. But the the algorithm was was um, uh, was more uh, as a, a pre-programmed uh, probabilities for for the for the algorithms to 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 search the uh, to search the space uh, in order to uh, make the um, make better decisions in order to beat the human. Um, in the uh, early uh, 2000s, uh, there has been an explosion of uh, computational technologies that has allowed the parallelizations of many of these algorithms, and namely the neural networks algorithms uh, that can be uh, used in the GPUs uh, in order to, to make the computation uh, efficient. So in, in 2012, uh, we have additional uh, um, essentially state-of-the-art technologies like residual neural networks and GANs uh, or gener generative adversarial networks and after that is DeepMind's AlphaGo which is an algorithm based on reinforcement learning that better human that beats human in the most complex um, uh, computer games called Go um, and uh, the advance of additional bots that are that are geared towards the uh, combat operation, namely the Huron systems, which are which is uh, acquired by Shield AI uh, recently. Uh, this AI essentially is is being integrated in in, in some um, military aerial platforms to uh, to engage uh, in in what is called the MOMT or uh, essentially teaming or uh, human uh, and machine teaming environment in combat uh, to uh, make a significant impact in the outcome of, of, uh, of conflicts or armed conflict, conflicts. Uh, in 2020, OpenAI created the, what is called GP3, and this is a highly in intelligence uh, uh, program that generate a very... Uh, legible uh, subject or specific subject based on few inputs from the user um, and obviously this this history is not exhaustive by any means but uh, nonetheless is, is, is just shows the the, the, the the advantage of many of these technologies thanks to uh, the you know the the, the, the computational uh, capacity of computers and and the advanced advances that are made in the, in the AI research. Um, so what is AI? The, the goal of AI is to perceive, reason, construct knowledge, infer, plan, decide, learn, communicate, and efficiently manipulate the environment. This is essentially the, the, the goal of, of, of artificial intelligence machine. And as it is now, it is divided in, um, in, in top level to in, in symbolic AI. Uh, which includes some of the earliest concepts like logic-based methods and knowledge-based methods. And then we have learning AI, which has machine learning and probabilistic methods. And some symbolic AI, which contains optimization 
uh, optimization methods, search methods, um, and distributed system um, uh, algorithms, or like multi-agent uh, algorithms based, uh, based methods. Uh, so the focus will be mainly on the machine learning and optimization, and optimization search and distributed system. Since a lot of the uh, major advances in AI are based on these methods, uh, the machine machine learning is the ability of a machine to learn from data for the purpose of making accurate predictions. And uh, in grosso modo, it is divided into four classes of learning: as supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, and reinforcement learning. Uh, this is uh, just to show the AI tiers, and, and this is just my take on where the current stage of the art. Obviously, that's debatable, but uh, we are still essentially in narrow intelligence. Uh, so these are the three tiers. Uh, the, the artificial narrow intelligence essentially is context-specific reasoning, uh, inference, and uh, test-focused uh, decision-making, and autonomous planning, learning, and communication. Whereas artificial general intelligence is, is, is has or ought to be general, um, and we are we are uh, creating right now algorithms that sort of mimic general intelligence, but it's it's really it's still pretty much still uh, artificial neural intelligence if you look deep at it, um, and the the conceptual. Uh, conceptual uh, idea of artificial super intelligence will it will it will have it will supersede um, all the previous uh, artificial general intelligence and, and obviously the narrow one but it is it is meant to uh, to uh, to go beyond what humans are capable of uh, by doing autonomous tasks uh, decision making, planning, learning, and imitation that surpasses the capability of the human, and also communicate and express emotions and uh, and reason, obviously, far beyond uh, what humans can. Now we talk about state of the art methods, uh, and again, this, these methods are not exhaustive. Uh, these are very brief outline of the state of the art. Um, but, but nonetheless uh, are important uh, to mention uh, as they are, uh, they could uh, provide the rich, uh, rich uh, back baggage of, 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 of algorithms that, are, that can be leveraged for, for weapon systems. Uh, we'll start with the learning AI paradigm and we'll talk about deep learning. So uh, deep learning is the application of Deep neural network structures divulge abstract and high-level context from, from, from data for, for the prediction, for the purpose of predicting uh, an output uh, correctly. Um, so some of the, uh, the top used, uh, state-of-the-art top used architectures with, which, which go into a lot of these state-of-the-art uh, frameworks like uh, YOLO, Retina, Net, and, and all, the, the backbone of them of these are these topologies. The, one of them is called the ResNet, and then this net, and then SparseNet, and there's the other one like LeNet and, and additional ones. But uh, the the success of these uh, network topologies are in image classification, object detection, panel recognition, and uh, image segmentation. Uh, some of the, um, the advantages or the characteristic of ResNet is, uh, is it is divided to solve vanishing gradient problem and degradation problem. And it has uh, shown improved performance over previous deep CNN architectures or uh, convolutional neural network architecture like VGG. Uh, DenseNet are, have some advantages as well uh, as they are easier to train compared to uh, previous uh, uh, convolutional networks architectures, and um, uh, they provide the uh, best representation of images when applied to near identical images uh, in the uh, ImageNet uh, dataset, particularly. Um, and as you can see, these the the use the use case for, for for these topologies is mainly in the perception realm, but also you could they could be used in, in many. Um, 
uh, in many tech, in many domain uh, problem domains as well. But uh, their success is is highly uh, is highlighted in these in these uh, problem domains uh, as shown in the table. Uh, SparseNet, uh, what it does is that it specifies the densities uh, to improve the performance, and but it requires deep uh, deep layers uh, between 28 and 76 layers. Uh, some of the other uh, non-convolutional architectures are the recurrent neural network architecture, and the the, the, the top topologies are the uh, long uh, short-term memory architecture, uh, the gated uh, register unit, and the uh, non-linear autoregressive with the exogenous input uh, architecture. And uh, the use of uh, LST LSTM is usually in, is, is typically in time series processing and speech, speech break recognition, speech synthesis and auto, audio processing. But it, has, it, is, it is also used in combination uh, either reinforcement learning or deep learning architectures to provide a sort of uh, temporal, spatial temporal uh, information to, uh, for 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 uh, divulging patterns for for other networks uh, for an end uh, uh, solution for a problem, but they can be used alone again for for time series processing or in combination with other pro, pro, uh, other pro, uh, algorithms. Um, GRUs are alternative approach to uh, approach to. Um, the known problem that is that is that is seen in RNN, which is the vanishing gradient problem. So GRUs uh, uh, appear to have uh, uh, less susceptibility in, in this problem, and it uses less memory and runs faster than the, the LSTMs. Uh, they are they are they are used in scene graph generation, semantic exploitation, relation extractions. Um, as far as NARX, uh, it is mainly used for system identification, nonlinear filtering. Um, it adds feedback connection to the enclosed several layers of the network and adopts an autoregressive model, which is which is these these are time series forecasting mathematical models uh, that has that have a regressor and they're, they're linear in nature, but but uh, you know uh, but having that structure in neural networks. Uh, provide a lot far, far uh, more capable um, algorithm as it, it can be used in nonlinear problems uh, in order to uh, model a dynamic system. If you will. Um, so again, it's for system identification of dynamic systems and nonlinear filter. Um, other specialized ne network are auto encoder. Um, so these are um, sort of used for uh, self-supervised learning networks uh, and supervised learning via um, uh, of data representation via encoding, compression, and reconstruction. And they're used for dimensional reduction, feature clustering, and data compression. Um, the GANs uh, are generative um, models and they generate, uh, they generate novel samples from statistical distribution of the original samples. But they suffer, uh, they're known to suffer from convergence issues, nonetheless, but, but they're very important in terms of uh, interpretation of contact, content from data and generation of novel version of the data. So they become very useful in generating novel samples from, from limited samples of a particular um, domain, uh, of a particular problem if it has a lack of samples or these, these Generative models can be used for that purpose to uh, enrich the data sample space. Uh, other uh, specialized uh, networks are the GNNs. Uh, and they are motivated partly by the inability of CNN to handle non euclidean type uh, type of data. And again, GNN stands for uh, graph neural networks. So they are, they are based on graph structure. Um, in, in data structure, uh, graph data structure, which are, uh, are used, heavily used in the uh, uh, in algorithm for path planning and that sort of uh, problem domain. Um, inference on graph represent, represented data having complex relationship and object inter, 
interdependencies, these are some of the characteristics of DNN. And they, are, uh, they have been successfully uh, used in image classification, scene graph generation, as well as recommended, recommender systems and program reasoning. And, um, and the last uh, specialized network we have on the table is the DPN. These are um, deep uh, belief networks, and they are essentially based on generative stochastic neural nets that learn probability distribution from input data. Uh, they appear to be less computationally expensive compared to forward neural networks. However, because they are based on uh, Boltzmann machine-based structures, they are uh, they they require some knowledge. Um, and the, the use of uh, or success is in the image classification, motion captures, nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Uh, so yeah, so uh, the key takeaway is that they are based on Boltzmann. Boltzmann machine, and they are they are uh, they require some solid theoretical knowledge there. Uh, another uh, type of algorithms uh, within the learning AI paradigms is the reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, reinforcement learning essentially models natural learning process of living system via action reward mechanism. Uh, it is uh, most of the important contribution of reinforcement learning are based on the MDP, which are the Markov decision processes. This is how they are modeled on. Um, but um, but they are essentially uh, formulated in, in single agent uh, formulation or multi-agent science. Uh, in SAR, or the single agent to reinforcement learning, uh, actions uh, that uh, our behavior uh, that engine can do uh, to change the stage, which are representation of the sense environment, uh, and, and the rewards are the utility of the agents received for performing desired actions. And, our, and the objective is to learn the policy that specifies through time which actions to take from each state to maximize cumulative reward, leading to overall desired behavior. In the multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, the, the concept essentially is concerned with how multiple agents interact with one another and with the environment in which they are all in, and they can be formulated to address multiple settings, cooperative, competitive, adversarial objectives, as well as their combination. Um, examples of, of single-agent reinforcement learning applications uh, were performed in plurality of, of, of problems, but just to give you an example, but the difference between the two is uh, SARLs is for, for, for single agents, essentially, uh, and for robotic manipulator, robotic applications are a single, single agency. Um, robotic manipulator learning to organize its environment, for example, uh, humanoid learning to walk, uh, culinary learning to self-park. Um, the multiple uh, or multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning, we can find this real robotic rescue uh, type of solution uh, in which the, it's essentially based on the formulation of cooperative model, uh, um, collaborative manufacturing again, so another example of co co uh, cooperative or collaborative model, and the uh, swarm teaming, uh, for example, uh, for uh, Unmanned combat aerial vehicle teaming uh, to target uh, objects. So you'll have a multiple or a mix of these um, uh, formulations. Uh, an example of co cooperative and adversarial. And uh, some advantages are, are uh, showcased here on this table. Um, so uh, the advantages of, uh, of, of SARL essentially is the uh, is that the environment is represented by the uncertainties and dynamics, nonlinearities, disturbances and models and errors. All, all of these are, you know, in comparison to control theory, for example, uh, the, the modeling of errors and, and uncertainties and nonlinearities are, are essentially very, uh, essentially are, they have to be modeled themselves or, uh, or a model mathematically or modeled via system identification or have a bound on them 
uh, either via the explicit statistical uh, statistical modeling or, or or things like called the membership set uh, theory, essentially, which puts, which puts bounds on these errors and non-linearities and disturbances. But the advantage of reinforcement learning is that all these aspects that plague uh, system modeling are all combined in what is called the environment. And uh, another advantage of the SAR is that you don't have to have an explicit model of, the, of your dynamic system. It can be model-free, albeit there are formulation for reinforcement learning with model, uh, the called model-based uh, model based reinforcement learning algorithms. But some of the advantages, like I said, can be model-free and no prior knowledge of the reward function. Uh, the reward function would be the equivalent of the cost function in optimal control, control theory, and the policy would be the control law. Um, so it's just the the two different fields have uh, you know, similar but yet a little bit different terminologies. Um, uh, the advantages of also for the advantages of SAR are handling of stochastic nonlinear dynamics and the ability to solve generalized reward function such as non-quadratic reward or cost functions. Um, the, there are some drawbacks and obviously uh, they require significant training data and consequently training time. Uh, they can have some convergence issues uh, in, in many, many situations uh, and scalability issues as well. Um, in, the, in the case of unknown reward function, uh, positive reward is function of the agent exploration uh, of, of the environment. So there is something called exploration, exploitation uh, problem in reinforcement learning where you have to balance balance between what this machine has already already learned and the 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 eventual and, and also between the exploitation, the need to exploit in order to learn better from the environment in order to to reach optimal policy. Uh, for, for the multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning, the advantages are experience sharing between agents in the co cooperative settings, uh, behavior imitation of human or qualified agents if they are trained, um, inherent redundancy in the homogeneous uh, top of uh, multiple uh, agent reinforcement learning, which provide the increased robustness of these uh, of these of these uh, multi-agent uh, operations. Um, the drawbacks uh, come from the nature of the of the, of the setting is that the, there is an explosion of the search space and the combinatorial nature of the model, uh, much dimensionally of much dimensionality of the state space pose a lot of challenges, and these challenges are non-stationarity of the environment due to the concurrent action of other agents, uh, the non-uniqueness of the learning goal, which lead to enrichability of the multi-objective equilibrium and joint action space increased exponentially leading to stability problems. Um, so uh, again, this is just some of the state-of-the-art methods in reinforcement learning, and these are algorithms or variants of the reinforcement learning uh, formulation. And uh, some of the top top models are, are the following, are the uh, deep pure, pure learning, uh, which include dual deep uh, Qube networks or DQN, uh, prioritized DQ, DQN or the DQN, uh, deep policy gradient methods like PPO, proximal um, policy optimization, actual critic, and uh, actual critic with experience, experience replay. There are uh, also deterministic policy gradients or DPG, soft actual critic, uh, which is a bridge between Q learning and DPG. Uh, these are all uh, an example of the state-of-the-art uh, model-based uh, or actually model-free uh, model uh, algorithms. The model-based are the manifest state-based uh, reinforcement learning uh, algorithms and the latent uh, state-based reinforcement learning algorithms. algorithms. Um, now, the other uh, methods we talked about beside the learning paradigms is the set of algorithms that are uh, are in the optimization realm. Uh, so these are optimization search algorithms. Uh, we would start with the stochastic optimization as there are additional type of optimization algorithm. We, we, we deal specifically with stochastic optimization due to 
sort of stochastic nature of events that happen in the dynamic environments. So mathematically, they are these these stochastic events are captured by stochastic mathematical modeling and hence the stochastic optimization. So it is a family of methods for minimizing and maximizing objection function when randomness is present in the system. Um, an important concept in optimization is, is heuristics and meta heuristics, and these are algorithm, uh, algorithms that are important in the categorization of our approximate methods for mathematical optimization. They refer to how algorithms perform approximate optimal solution searches and the type of problem they solve. Heuristics are problem specific methods and they are algorithms that perform informed search, systematically exploring the search space under a constant heuristic rule. However, they are prone to a local optimal trap. That is, you are in a local, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, search space, you will have this local dips uh, in the, in the, uh, in, in the manifold, if you will. And, uh, you know, the, you know, heuristics who tend to get stuck in the in the local optima and thinking that it's an optima where it isn't it is a suboptimal or or non-optimal solution in, in a certain region so um so even though they they attempt to solve the problem they still have they still have the susceptibility also to 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 fall into these local traps uh meta heuristics are non-problem specifics they're generalized methods but they have a better strategies for uh, high level strategies for informing and guiding search uh, using multiple criteria. So they, they solve the heuristic problems uh, because they, they have multiple strategies, high level strategies to escape and, and reach a better solution. Uh, hopefully the global search, a global search uh, option. Um, so they are updated to they are updated to better explore the search space and they are suitable for multi objective optimization problems as well. <laughs> um, another uh, uh, family of uh, algorithms that are within stochastic optimizations uh, and meta heuristics are the swarm, swarm intelligence uh, algorithms. And essentially they, they model behavior patterns that form from decentralized collective action distributed self-organized agents. Uh, they, they are based on a lot of the, the observation from the animal world and how certain uh, animals behave a certain way to, to, to uh, essentially the, the, the collective actions uh, appear to be organized and, and provide uh, an advantageous uh, output for, for, for the whole, the whole, uh, uh, whole uh, agency, I mean, in the multiple agents. Uh, so each, each individual agent acts and reacts according to its local rule from which a complex group behavior, behavior unfolds. The resultant collective behavior is more advantageous over individual actions. Um, and another uh, uh, algorithm family is evolutionary algorithms. Uh, and again, they are nature-inspired stochastic search algorithms which employ evol evolution principles uh, among other evolutional principles, but in the case of uh, in a generic uh, algorithm, which is one example of evolution algorithms, they use principles of reproduction, genetic crossover, mutation to improve the outcome of desired quantity, uh, uh, namely fitness uh, fitness uh, criteria uh, in a system. Uh, so they offer a number of advantages. Uh, they may be applied without an expert knowledge of domain-specific heuristics. Uh, they are less susceptible to the choice of initial conditions. Uh, they appear to be less susceptible to reachability issues and hence over a global solution. Entire solution space is sampled because they, they sample randomly over the whole, uh, the whole uh, samples. Um, so they, 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 are, they have they, they, they deal with the reship, they, they, have, they offer a better reshipability uh, advantage over, uh, over other problems. Um, so yeah, so they are, they are, uh, they are robust in the, in the, in the context. Um, and, and in a comparison with gradient based optimization uh, methods, again, they, they, they 
in, in certain class of problems, they, uh, they seem to be robust. The key word here is a, a class of problems. Uh, but they can take a long time also to, to provide the solution. Uh, they are very computationally intensive as well. So. Um, hey, yes. hey, Sam, this is Brian. I want to quickly interject here and see if in another minute or two, if you could try to just get ready and pull a bow in, in this presentation. I want to leave time for um, questions for the last 10 minutes here. Um, well, we one yeah, we, sure, sure. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of context in this presentation. The presentation. Yep. We, we can divide it if, if you will, if you would like, because I would like to, t uh, to take on... Um, you know, we haven't finished the state of the art methods, but we wanted to show where they apply in the systems or weapon systems. And this is very important. Uh, we're still in the state of the art methods. So um, let me finish first the state of the art methods and then we can talk, talk about where in the system. And hopefully we can do a second session because it is important to see where these algorithms are applied in, in different in different uh, subsystems of, of systems. Uh, yeah, for example, exactly. where they apply in autonomy, where they apply in perception, where they apply in GNC or guidance control and navigation, and, uh, and also electronic warfare. So, but again, uh, the report is available if you would want to go back into, um, you know, for a reference. Um, I mean, uh, would you like me to go ahead and, uh, and start taking the questions thus far? Because the presentation itself is, is, is lengthy and uh, there's yeah. plenty of interesting concepts. So. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll go ahead and put a pin on in it here, and we can um, okay. try to plan uh, another follow-up session to go over uh, more of it. Of course, as we've already mentioned, this is just kind of scratching the surface of really what is in, uh, described in much more length in the state of the art report. So I would mm -hmm. certainly encourage anyone to go to the website and download and read that state of the art report on DSI. That order. Um, so let's put a pin in here. Um, do we do have at least one question in the queue, and maybe we can get some other folks to submit some as well. Sure. I mean, there are. There seems to be a few questions already or already uh, input in the chat. Yeah. Um, but, but I wanted just to stress that uh, you know it would have been nice to actually continue on presentation to show where some of these algorithms are applied to different uh, different uh, uh, software stack in autonomy. Uh, and also to other uh, other areas of applications in the weapon systems like electronic or cognitive electronic warfare, opponent modeling, uh, and uh, GNC applications, path planning. So, so yeah, it, it seems like uh, it would be nice to continue on this for additional session on the uh, presentation. But we'll go ahead and take some questions. Okay, no, good, good point. All right, I'm going to go ahead and... Switch over to Q and A mode. Um, the one question that we in queue right now um, is asking, and I just read it out loud for those who dialed in. Says, what testing and evaluation requirements and criteria thresholds would you recommend for evaluating the AI performance of weapon systems before deployment and fielding? Well, AI. Uh, to answer these questions, AI uh, inherently means data, data, data. So it is data hungry, data required. Any type of, uh, before even getting to about evaluation requirements or testing or fielding, uh, just the, uh, the, essentially the metrics for, for, um, for testing AI has to be uh, extremely rigorous. Uh, but in order to get to that, to that level, the data or the training data has to be rich. Uh, truly rich, and there are multiple methods for which we can uh, we can use to enrich the data sample. Obviously, from capture uh, and measurements, as well as from generating a new data. Like for example, in the field of computer vision, for example, for perception uh, pipeline. You know, uh, you know, if you have objects uh, and limited amount of uh, of, of, of data re related to objects. Well, you can use image processing computer and computer vision to do a number of image manipulation in order to enrich the the, the object uh, capture uh, from lighting, uh, lighting processing, uh, like dimming, uh, increase the brightness, scaling or photogrammetric measurement, a photogrammetric processing essentially changing the projection, changing the rotations, scaling. 
Uh, so all these computer vision and image processing um, uh, tools we can use to enrich the, 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 the training samples, but also we can use uh, novel methods like GANs, for example, uh, albeit we say that it has some issue with, with certain class of problems where there's, there is uh, some uh, um, conversions problems, but nonetheless, there, there are very important uh, uh, topologies and they can enrich the, the they can they can enrich they can enrich the um, the uh, the training data. So uh, to to answer again the questions, what testing evaluation requirements? Um, the they are they are uh, they they are necessitated first by having a, a training set, a large rich training set, and then. The evaluation would be um, adopting rigorous uh, or robust metrics for assessing these uh, the, the the accuracy of these of these methods. Particularly, like for example, we talked about deep neural networks. We can uh, use these uh, number of information theory based metrics uh, in order to ascertain uh, some sort of accuracy from the models. Um, but yeah, so all this within the lab. So the, the testing has to be done, obviously, uh, in the labs, obviously, and, and to ensure that the, the, the success of these models are, uh, are done in a rigorous manner via mathematical or metrics, uh, mathematically uh, 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 modeled metrics uh, in order to ascertain their validity. Um, so I hope I answered that question. So all of this is way before fielding and before even uh, any kind of deployment. So. Oh, yeah. Good. No, and we got a message back saying thanks. Appreciate that response. Uh, the next question we have um, might be our last one, given our time. I want to honor our one hour. But the question asks, uh, it says, given your assessment of the current state of the art, when do you believe is a realistic date for AI to be incorporated into an operational kinetic weapon system? Well, uh, so the when we talk about AI, we talk about autonomy. Uh, essentially, is having a portions of the system that is done autonomously, right? Uh, right now, currently, as we speak, a lot of the weapon systems incorporate a great deal of, of uh, or level of autonomy, uh, in which some of the tasks are delegated to the actual machine uh, to autonomously perform. Uh, so, so when you look at, for example, the SNP, SNP, um, SNPA model for autonomy, uh, which was generated by National Institute of Standards, uh, Standards essentially, it uh, uh, there is a scale, right? So the scales go from a remote operation or essentially a remotely controlled uh, robot all the way to full autonomy and in between we are right now in level six seven and eight even where a lot of critical uh, critical uh, tasks are delegated to the machines case for example swarm swarm attack and targeting and uh, these have already been performed in a number of of of, of, uh, of platforms that have been tested recently between the period of 2016 and, and 2021 um, so as far as the kinetic weapons, um, which are essentially like things like uh, missiles and that sort of things, uh, we're already at level six and seven and eight for, in the SNPA model. And uh, so, so where do I see this? Uh, I mean, in, in, by 2030, we'll, we'll have a level eight uh, with confidence, meaning that a good chunk of automated tasks delegated. But nonetheless, there will never be a weapons where a human uh, agent is not in the loop. There will always be for, for ethical purposes, obviously, and for, for safety purposes, safety theoretical purposes, that a human will be in the loop nonetheless to interject decision and have the uh, the last uh, decision uh, um, output, if you will, for 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 an end uh, for an event. Uh, so a lot of these tasks can be delegated and has already been done. Uh, 
um, like I said, again, for like swarming, uh, swarming uh, uh, applications. Um, electronic warfare that has used reinforcement learning for counter, for uh, electronic counter countermeasures, ECCM, uh, where they, they, they are successful in, in actually countering ECM measures. Uh, and, and the way they do that is by using something called cognitive radio, where they actually confuse the attacks and further adapt to that to that uh, to that dynamic system that try to jam and spoof a certain signal. So these can be done automatically, and there's already so uh, for for uh, electronic warfare is not a kinetic weapon system, but the point is a great deal of of of, of autonomy could be delegated to the system. But again, uh, a human will always be in the loop and will be looking between the level six to level eight. That's, that's my take on it. Very good. All right, well. Um, somebody, somebody, somebody mentioned that, yes, human the loop does not prevent yep. strategies. That is correct, that is correct. So that's why, that is why uh, uh, the, the automation or, or the autonomy is, has to be done uh, with utmost rigorous testing uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, nonetheless, there, there are, there are proven, already proven, uh, tasks that can be relegated, uh, relegated to, to machines and that have been, uh, successfully implemented. Well, let, let's just say, for example, uh, autonomous navigation and autonomous navigation does not take any action per se, but they, they, they work based on the information and the navigation, auto navigation and loitering, for example, could be, could be just delegated. It's just that the end, the end, uh, uh, or the end objective has to be always uh, looked into by human uh, for for uh, all the way to high echelon command and control decision making to make sure that to make sure that the the end uh, objective is reached optimally. Next okay. question. Yeah. Well, you know what? We are at the top of the bottom of the hour, top of the hour, whichever you want to look at it. And I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll honor that time constraint as these folks dropping off anyway. So I think we'll end it here. We'll hopefully be able to schedule another follow on Sam. And of course, we'll keep everyone posted when we schedule that. Yes, um, uh, I'll, I'll look forward to another session because some of the content here in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in this presentation kind of uh, mapped uh, in, in certain uh, problem domain in the weapon systems. It would be nice to talk about those and yes. kind of stimulate some ideas for, for folks that are uh, attending the, the meeting. Yep, very good. And uh, final co final recommendation or referral for everybody, go to uh, dsiac.org, state of the art reports, and you can find the more lengthy state of the art report that covers a lot of these topics. Um, and until then, uh, until the next follow on meeting, I uh, appreciate everyone's time and joining in. And Sam, thank you so much for the presentation. My pleasure, I look forward to the session. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.